Welcome to the Legacy Leaders Podcast. Are you doing the best for your client to help them create their legacy? Are you creating a plan that goes far beyond finances to help people ensure that it becomes the driving force behind all decisions? On this podcast, hosts Katie Beth Hand and Stan Miller will help you with growing your practice and your client's peace of mind. Together, they bring the best and brightest minds to share with you how to help your clients develop their best legacy. And now, here are your hosts, Katie Beth and Stan. Welcome to the Your Life, Your Legacy podcast with your hosts, Stan Miller and Katie Beth Hand. Our guest today is the former president of Men's Warehouse turned philanthropist, Charlie Bresler. Charlie, thank you so much for joining us. We are so excited to have you with us on the show this morning. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and the people who are listening to the podcast. Absolutely. So before we dive right in, we have lots to talk about, but you have a very interesting background. And so I wanted to take just a few minutes to talk about that and see if you can tell us a little bit about that. You went to New York, to New York University and then Harvard, and you did that for history. And then you got your PhD in social and clinical psychology. Then you became the president of Men's Warehouse. How did all of, how did one thing lead to another? Walk us through sort of your background and how, how all of those things worked. I, I was hoping you could tell me. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, but, you know, as a psychologist, I believe that people really don't know why they do what they do. And there's a fair amount of research to show that people think they know why they do what they do, but they don't. So I'm going to give you my version of causality here without any with the disclaimer that it, it may all be sort of fabricated or uh, but I will do my best. So and obviously I've been asked this question before because I have such a nonlinear work history and I'm not known to be schizophrenic. So it's really, um, really odd uh, work history and sort of background. So if I wander too far, let me know. But I guess I would start that I went to NYU during the height of the anti-Vietnam War movement and the civil rights movement had, was already ongoing in the United States for many years since the 50s and certainly in Little Rock, you have a sense of what the civil rights movement was much more than I do. But I got involved in the anti-war movement and, and, and to some extent, the civil rights movement, um, even though I was a white male. Um, and that energized me academically and got me really excited about history, which I'd already been interested in. And so after I graduated, I decided to get a joint degree in history and, and education. So I went to Harvard and um, spent time there learning about secondary education and, and, and taking courses like in French history. Um, and it was really a, an interesting time. And then, um, but I slowly moved away from any kind of being an activist to being just kind of a high school teacher, if you will. So um, although what I learned uh, in history and what I learned through my own uh, activities infiltrated or permeated my teaching um, in the three years I taught secondary school. My wife and I got married in 1973. We had met when we were seniors in high school. Um, and I'd like to say we're still married. Um, and uh, she's been transformational in my life because um, I had a pretty difficult uh, background. Both my parents uh, had severe mental problems. So uh, she was really a, a corrective emotional experience, I guess, as well as a wonderful partner throughout my life. So anyway, we went out to California and I taught at the Thatcher School, which is kind of an elite boys school in Ojai, California. We came back east. I taught in a public high school in, in Western Massachusetts. And after three years, I decided that, that I really didn't want to do this anymore. Oddly enough, I went and taught tennis and played lots of tennis tournaments and managed a tennis club. So it was a real break, but I wasn't in any way connected to any of the interesting political things that I've been thinking about or, or doing. Um, so I really went in this kind of walkabout, if you will, almost like, a um, yeah, it had nothing to do with what I had been focused on, but it was very much fun sort of ties into my hedonistic streak. I'll talk about that a little bit later because I think of myself as like an effective hedonist or at least an aspiring effective hedonist where I'm not just a hedonist, but I'm trying to be a really good one, which I can explain later. So anyway, after doing the tennis stint, I wandered into community mental health 
And when Diana got into medical school, I said to myself, geez, Charlie, you're not, you don't have a strong enough ego to be a second rate tennis pro and a psych tech. So you better do something because you're going to be hanging out with a bunch of arrogant doctors, uh, my, my wife, um, who's not arrogant. And so I went and got my PhD in social and clinical psychology, and I had a, a really great educational experience. And after that, I got a job as the director of behavioral medicine at the California School of Professional Psychology, where I taught for seven years. Um, I also started an anxiety and stress disorders clinic, specializing in obsessive compulsive disorder and uh, panic disorder and agoraphobia. So if I haven't put you to sleep by now, <clears throat> I can talk to you about why I got involved in business. So after seven years, Diane and I were living, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Central Valley of California, and we said, we better get out of here. We don't want to raise our children here. It's like 100 degrees Fahrenheit, four months a year. And it's really not that much to do. And so we decided to move to the Bay Area. And I said to Diane, if you get a job, I'll figure out something to do. Because I hadn't published enough to get a job at Stanford or even Santa Clara. So I knew that I was not going to stay in academia. And at that time, George Zimmer, who was an old childhood friend of mine, but I hadn't been in touch with since our senior, my freshman year in college, uh, where we both went to Washington University, I went only for one year before going to NYU. George approached me, I won't get explain how we ran into each other. And he asked me if I would go to the men's warehouse and start a training program uh, for his newly public company. This was back in 1993. And I said, well, geez, George, if you'll pay me uh, $20,000 more than I would make for this anxiety clinic I was starting to do for a psychiatric hospital, I'll do it. He said, yes. You can see how mercenary I was. And uh, anyway, he said yes. And lo and behold, that started my career at the Men's Warehouse. And I was lucky enough that <clears throat> the behavioral program I started for our salespeople, using what I'd learned in psychology, um, ended up raising the average transaction 13%. So even though I had no background in business, I just kind of stumbled into this luck because I was able to use my psychology background to basically increase the amount of sales that people did at the men's warehouse. And that sort of launched my career. And eventually, I in I think it was 2005, I became president and sort of heir apparent to become CEO. And then in 2008, I said to myself, Charlie, you're 59 years old. You better like do something that really is going to be consistent with those values you talked about all your life and that you raise your children with, or else it's never going to happen. So I went into George's office and I said, you know, George, I really appreciate this, but I'm leaving and uh, I don't want to be the next CEO or continue, but I'm happy to consult for a while if you'd like. And we talked to the board and anyway, at that point, I wasn't sure what I was going to do, but I was lucky enough to get some HR uh, volunteer consulting gigs with some very interesting people. And then in 2012, I read Peter Singer's The Life You Can Save. And it wasn't an epiphany for me, like, but it was catalytic because at that point, I knew that I wanted to work with Peter if I could and help save the lives, particularly of children under five who were dying of preventable illnesses in Sub-Saharan Africa. And it, I had felt frustrated that I hadn't lived my values. I also felt frustrated that, like a lot of people, that I didn't know how to make an impact in the world. And so I felt like, gosh, um, I could really make an impact, even though I'm not a very special person. But if I do this, we could really work together and grow this nonprofit and and really help a whole bunch of children and other people who live in extreme poverty and who you can help for minimal amounts of money because the dollar goes so far in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. So I convinced Peter, I'd never met him. I sent him an email and I convinced Peter to let Diane and I donate the money to start a proper nonprofit, become a 501c3. And I guess the rest is history, as they say, but that was the nonlinear journey from kind of mediocre tennis pro uh, to a psychologist, to business person, to, uh, to, I would not think of myself as a philanthropist, but as somebody who saw the opportunity that we could use the resources that we were lucky enough to get from all the men and women who worked really hard at the men's warehouse in our stores till 9 30, 10 o'clock at night, that we were able to benefit from that and now pass some of that many on to through the life you can save. Does That's that help? Probably the, that's the best non-linear background story I've ever heard, Charlie. I love it. 
It's it's so good. I want to talk a little bit um, a little bit more and dive into the life you can save. It's it's such an interesting uh, just just program and opportunity. And so tell our listeners a little bit more about exactly how the life you can save works and the work that it does. Um yeah, sure. I mean, obviously I'm really I love talking about the life you can save and 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 what Peter has been able to create and then the team that I was lucky enough to put together that is doing this fabulous work um, that I think is really making a difference. So we do two things primarily. We develop and curate content that we think will help people understand the opportunity they have to help people living in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, most money that's donated by generous Americans and Americans are, are very generous as a group is donated to the domestically, understandably, with the idea that charity begins at home. Only about 6% of the money that's donated annually of the four to $500 billion that Americans donate, only about 6% of that goes overseas. And most of that isn't necessarily to very highly impactful nonprofits. So we promote content, including the book, which we bought back from Random House, The Life You Can Save. And we made it available on our website as a free download, as a celebrity read audio book or ebook. And so one of our main things is to distribute the book, The Life You Can Save. That's a piece of content that was instrumental in many people's lives in getting them to see opportunities as well as obligation they may have to do good. But also we cre we're creating new content that is short form video and is more accessible to people who don't want to even listen to an audio book or read, a, read an ebook. Um, and so that's one part of what we're doing. The other part of what we're doing is we curate, we have a very talented uh, research curation team, uh, Katie Stanford and Matias Nestori, and they curate with very careful work, nonprofits that are high impact, cost effective nonprofits operating in South Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa that are mostly helping in the health area, but we have a, we have charity, uh, in, uh, we have nonprofits in climate change, education um, as well. Um, and we're going to be releasing uh, work on violence against women and girls. All of these things disproportionately have an adverse impact on people living in poverty. So Katie and Matias, using lots of other people's work, curate these nonprofits. And so we have 25 nonprofits on our website. They give people different types of opportunities to donate. So we're doing to sort of sum up here for the first part of this question or first answer this question is we we curate really hopefully interesting material including Peter's book The Life You Can Save that we can distribute and that people can take advantage of learning more and then we also really advocate people to donate uh to these nonprofits. I should add that we also are encouraging people to donate directly to The Life You Can Save itself. So we believe that roughly for the last 10 years, every dollar that we've spent on our own distribution or creation of content or team has raised $15 for these nonprofits. So we call that the leverage ratio. And that is the reason that Diane and I continue to give almost all the money that we donate to, uh, to nonprofits to the Life You Can Save itself because we believe that by helping grow the team and adding more talent to the team, we can actually raise more money for our nonprofits. So we're encouraging people to donate to our recommended nonprofits, but we're also encouraging particularly large donors who can really help us grow the nonprofit uh, to donate to the Life You Can Save itself and to chat with us, me or one of the other people senior in the organization about why that is a really good, impactful uh, investment, if you will. That's that's fantastic. And for our listeners, when you visit the life you can save org, you can actually go and find a complete list of all of the different charities. And so if it's something you're interested in or you want to know more about, know that you can jump on their website and actually look at an overview, a description of each of these charities. So if there is a particular uh, charity or cause that you are interested in, go in and do some research and you can hopefully find one that matches that here. My my next question for you, Charlie, is what is it that drew your interest to uh, 
South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa in particular? Is it because the dollar, the U.S. dollar stretches so far there? Is that the, the thought process there? Or was there an experience or something else that really piqued your interest in those two areas in particular? No, it's more for me, unlike a lot of people who go to those areas and, 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 and see the grinding poverty. For me, it was an intellectual exercise, I guess, primarily that I realized a dollar goes a lot further and that of the 735 million people living in extreme poverty, and there's lots of people living in poverty, including uh, throughout the United States and Western Europe and Australia are key markets, that the people living in extreme poverty um, are disproportionately in South Asia and in Sub-Saharan Africa, and that a dollar given to the right organization um, goes dramatically further. For example, um, it costs about $40,000 to train a guide dog to help one of us who's blind. And if you're blind, you would love to have a really talented guide dog. It costs about $40,000 to train that guide dog. You can cure a child of blindness who's had congenital cataracts, for example, for $50. So when you look at the scale of like treating somebody who's blind, and we'd all want a guide dog for sure if we were blind, but you look if we had a child with cataracts that wouldn't was blind, um, and it really... There's a video that the Fred Hollis Foundation put out of a girl getting the bandages off for the first time with her mother and seeing the doctor and, and him raising his fingers and sure, her being able to say how many fingers he raised for the first time she was seeing. You know, for $50, I'm getting chills when I talk about it. I always do. Um, it's like you say to yourself, you know what? I'd like a guide dog, but I want to help that child in Africa for $50. So it's those kinds of opportunities that, I, I reached in an intellectual basis and reading Peter's book and putting it together and saying, I have been negligent as a person in addressing the world's problems, but I don't know how to do that. I feel kind of hopeless about how to really make things different. And then I realized um, that I could, I could make a difference without having to have a lot of talent. There was also a movie, The Constant Gardener, that maybe some of your viewers have seen that really had an impact. There's this scene where Rachel Wise turns to Ralph Fiennes. She's about to go off into the country and he, her husband, doesn't want her to go because he thinks it's particularly dangerous. They're in Sub-Saharan Africa at the time. And he says, you cannot save all these people. And he's begging her not to go. And she turns to him and she's quite a good actress. So she does this much better than me. But she turns to him and says, you're right. I can't save all those people, but I can save one. And it was that kind of thing that really drew me to it. Absolutely. I love that. I love that. To to kind of take a turn, and then I promise, Stan, I'll let you ask questions in a minute. To take a turn, kind of on the same vein as well, you also have a podcast, Charlie, The Musings Podcast. So talk to me about what our listeners can expect from The Musings Podcast, what that goal was. Do you ever talk about things that relate to the life you can save on that? Tell us about the podcast. So the podcast is called Musings About Ourselves and Other Strangers. And we are exploring people's journeys, kind of like you've asked me about. And we try to look at things like people's values and how they actualize those values and what gaps they may find between their values and their actual behavior. We explore um, people's lifestyle balance. I mean, some of these people are really Many of them are prominent people. Others are more regular people. It's a diverse group. We have uh, white males from the United States. We have two Indian women that I've interviewed thus far that are fascinating. Um, and we, we're looking at the diversity of experiences. In term, but the theme really is how people approach morality and how they think about living a moral life and, and how they're viewing their own life uh, and how they balance their family with their work and the other things that are going on in life, including their giving. And inevitably, we talk about the life you can save. And the podcast is certainly tied to the life you can save. But we explore different themes that the guests want to explore. Not everyone agrees with our point of view about giving, which makes it very interesting. And I've been so far really blessed to have real people that are really interesting. Mike Shore, who produced The Good Place, and uh, many of you may know as a Hollywood producer um, has been on the podcast and um, there are just a number of very interesting, some of the people famous, some not so famous, 
but it's really just wanders around uh, looking at these central issues in people's lives, but from very different perspectives. And I try to do my best to keep my mouth shut and let the guests speak for themselves. But you know, as a podcast host, there's always a balance because uh, some of people maybe like me go on and on and on and you want to ask them more questions, but you want to politely like say, okay, but now I have the next question. But um, the people are, are interesting and I really encourage people to go to the podcast and, and listen to the f a few of the episodes and subscribe um, because I think it, be, in spite of me, and I'm not being overly modest when I say this, but in spite of me, these podcasts are very interesting because of the guests. That's that's fantastic. Question, uh, Stan, what questions do you have for Charlie? Yeah, lots of questions. So, Charlie, one of the questions I have is, you know, let me let me start by saying this. One of the things I know, one of the is that one of the reasons people don't give is this fear they have that they'll look stupid because they'll read in the paper a month later that this charity they gave to, you know, just uh, paid a $5 million bonus to the CEO. And they realized that they were, you know, th that they just contributed to that. So it, you know, what I'm hearing you say about um, this, about your, your, your charity is it, it sounds like you guys uh, make some real investment of due diligence in these not-for-profits that you support. Tell me how that process works. How do you go about uh, looking at a charity to determine its uh, effectiveness in the use of the resources that you ultimately allocate to it? So we have this uh, evaluation framework that Katie and Matthias have created that sets the framework for how we evaluate charities. Um, are they dealing with problems that can be solved? <clears throat> can the work be scaled? Do they do what they say they do? Are they a financially responsible organization? Those are some of the things that are included in this charity evaluation framework. Katie would be much more articulate about this process uh, than I am. Um, and if anybody wants more details about it, they certainly can get in touch with Katie. But basically what they do is they create this framework and then they look at the nonprofits in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia that other people have supported and then they scrutinize those. And then they do a lot of research about the types of problems that exist. Like we recently edited, Matthias did a ton of work on the best education charities um, in India and Sub-Saharan Africa. And they they know what the problem is. They try to figure out solutions that will help, for example, with school nutrition, as well as education, because it's hard to study and get ahead if you um, you haven't, you don't have, have a breakfast or a lunch, um, and you may not be having a dinner. So there's all this integrated work in trying to evaluate um, the nonprofits um, that, that we do. And so we're essentially saying to donors, you are not going to necessarily, even if you're extremely wealthy, have the resources to do this curation process. Um, and yes, you're relying on us to have done that in a really competent way. And we have advisors, Katie, myself, Matthias, and, and others, <clears throat> who are more than happy to talk to you one-on-one -on -one if you have doubts or try to allay your fears. But I, I always say there is a risk. I mean, there's a risk when you take a left-hand turn. And um, when you take a right-hand turn, if you live in the UK or, or Australia. And, and so where a lot of the people that we talk to live, and so I have to say left-hand turn or right-hand turn. So there's definitely a risk. You can't ever eliminate your risk. My, my wife's a doctor and she's constantly having to say when she gives advice, but I can't promise you this will work or there's no evidence. Fortunately, many of the charities that we curate and recommend have been through rigorous randomized controlled trials. <clears throat> and therefore, we know from the research that as of now, they're actually having a, an impact like they say they are. Um, but we also know that in science, there's a replicability crisis. There was a really interesting article in Science Magazine that showed that studies, even really well done studies in science, don't always replicate. You may have two or three, and then the next one isn't the same. Um, so we, for example, with the COVID vaccine, we felt that it would protect people from giving it to other people, but we found that it has really beneficial effects, but that's not one of them. So there always is a risk in science, but we believe that our process is largely scientific and certainly more than individuals 
can undertake on their own. Um, so that's the confidence that we have. As far as the large CEO salaries, uh, there are no large CEO salaries that I'm aware of in any of the nonprofits we recommend. Um, it's interesting, the life you can save itself is fortunate enough that the three senior people in the organization have no salary, even though they're working full time. And uh, the reason they have no salary is that we, the three of us have been fortunate enough through different circumstances in our life to make enough money that we got to a point, not that we're that, well, certainly Diane and I are not that rich, but we live in a way that we got to a point where we said, we don't really need any more money. So we really need to start using our money in a good way. And so we certainly don't at the Life You Can Save have too many salaries that are, are of that sort. We do have a lot of paid people here who are needing to earn a living. And if they didn't have this job, you know, they would have to get another job. So I don't mean to suggest it's a, in right. any way a volunteer organization. So that's my rather long answer to your short question. Yeah. So uh, I'd like for you to put a face on this, though. T tell me about, you know, I mean, we don't have hours and hours here, but tell me, uh, you know, give me a couple success stories. Tell me about some of the charities that 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 you guys have curated and the impact that that charity has had? That's a great question. So let me talk about um, two of them where I happen to have visited with the CEOs and gotten to know the CEOs really well over the years. So I'm going to talk about two of them. And oddly enough, although they both operate in Sub-Saharan Africa and a lot of the work that's being done, most of it is being done in Sub-Saharan Africa, both these nonprofits are located in London. And um Interestingly enough. So one of them is called Development Media International. And I'm very close in touch with this is subsequent to my work here, not before, with three of the leaders of that organization, including the CEO, whose name is Roy Head. And they do this really interesting thing where they go to countries that have high child mortality rates. That's one criteria and very low media rates which is another criteria. So from my background in doing advertising for the men's warehouse, where I was head of the marketing department, I can really relate to that because in order to have the maximum impact, they need a lot of children dying unnecessarily. And they also need to be able to get their message out, not too expensively. So they've identified five countries in Africa that fit that situation. There's actually more, but two of them are in war areas where they can't do their work. So what they do is they get local people to create radio spots or television spots that are primarily directed to get moms, and I say moms because they're the people that would do it, to go to health centers that are adequately staffed to deal with simple health problems like diarrhea or the treatment of malaria. Um, and they get moms to understand, for example, with diarrhea, that if you starve your child, you don't give them anything to drink or you don't give them anything to eat when they have diarrhea, you're actually killing them. Um, and what you need to do is take them to the health center to get rehydrated, which isn't a very complicated medical thing. But if you don't, they'll die. And so they have had they've done a lot of uh, randomized controlled trials to show that these videos or radio spots, depending upon whether it's better to reach people through radio or better to reach people through television, actually get moms to go to health centers and that the outcomes save children's lives for very, very little money. So that's an example of one of the nonprofits that we support. And actually, even though Diane and I give most of our money to the life you can save itself to grow, we have given money to develop Media International because it's really hard for me to resist that story. Um, I, I mentioned, an, oh, go ahead. Do you want to ask? A, no, no, you were, you were going to tell me you had another story. Yeah, I was going to give you, you one or two yeah. more. So what yeah, is sure. the Fred Hollows Foundation or SAVA? They do the same thing. They cure um, childhood blindness. Um, by the way, I should have said there are about 5.3 million children dying every year of largely preventable illnesses. If you do the math, that's a, that's a lot of children even per minute, um, which is overwhelming to people. It's hard for us to really relate to that number until you actually think of a particular individual that goes to the health center for diarrhea and gets treated and is, is cured. The other organization that I was going to highlight is Save in the Fred Hollis Foundation, and I already alluded to them. They cure childhood blindness, and they do it for an extremely low price. So they, they get surgeons who can perform cataract surgery, and they 
that for $50 per surgery, or it could be a little bit more depending upon the complications, they remove ca uh, congenital cataracts. They do other things to help children improve their sight or to prevent um, blindness, but I was just highlighting the cataract surgeries. So that is amazing. And there's a video um, that, sh that I alluded to where you can see a little girl getting her her bandages off for the first time. And so to me, that's a chilling, uh, really exciting thing. And then the third charity I would highlight is Against Malaria Foundation that distributes bed nets, insecticide treated bed nets in Sub-Saharan Africa. And they've done a lot of research to show that when people use these bed nets, which they get people to use properly because there's all kinds of ways people to use them and doesn't work so well, these bed nets can protect you from getting bitten um, by malaria infected mosquitoes and that if you use these bed nets they can last for up to three years and they they don't in and of itself save lives because not everyone who uses the bed net would have gotten bit it by would have gotten bit by an insecticide by a, a malaria ridden mosquito but they estimate for roughly two thousand dollars it ranges and depending on the estimate between five hundred and twenty six hundred dollars they're saving a life by distributing these bed nets. Because again, not everybody who uses the net would have gotten bitten, but it's protecting people who did. And malaria is a particularly pernicious disease for people under five years old and for pregnant women. So those are three organizations just off the top of my head uh, that I would highlight, but we have food fortification, we have education, we have climate change organizations. I will say a word about the climate change organizations because they're different because it's really much more difficult to measure the impact of an advocacy organization than it is to measure the the uh, impact of a single type of intervention like DMI or AMF. But we believe that climate change is such a pressing problem in the world and disproportionately at this point is affecting people living in extreme poverty, although if people in the United States were suffering from 100 degree temperatures for 60 days in a row, um, and attributed to climate change, they may think that they're the people that are suffering the most. But we think climate change is such a pressing problem that we've added cl some climate change uh, nonprofits to our website as as one way of uh, of supporting things. But it's a very different type of donation than the health donations, which are much clearer uh, to track their impact. I don't know if that answers your question, Bill, or not. Hopefully it does. Did I? You know, I, I wish we had two hours so you could tell me many more stories because I'm sure there are many more stories that you that you that you could share. Um, oh, the best but, way to hear these stories also is to talk to the, either the beneficiaries, the people who benefited from it, or even the people running the organization. So when people are interested in diving into this, we can direct them depending upon their level of interest. I mean, even people go to Africa and actually experience some of this work. Uh, firsthand, I just made a video, um, which is almost finished called, you don't have to be brave to save lives. Um, I was sitting in a studio of a friend of mine, who's an actor in LA, uh, and he was interviewing me for his podcast. And at the end of the interview, I said, Nick, would you mind if I just said something that I've been thinking about for quite a long time and you just filmed me and recorded it here in the studio? And so I basically rattled off this thing about how I'm not a very brave person and I've learned that you can actually save lives from the comfort of your own home. Anyway, we're we're turning that into a, a video, which is part animated and, and, and not, but um, I don't, yeah, it just, I don't know, it came to my mind to think about, um, it is really interesting to think of the many different ways people can emotionally connect with this. Um, and yes, there are a lot of ways that we could help people connect, not just listening to to me rattle on about it. So Charlie, earlier in this conversation, you, you used the word, uh, uh, I think you used the word hedonistic. Yeah. And, and you made some sort of a, an allusion to how we would talk about that later. So it's later now. So I want to hear about that. Well, thank you for asking, because sometimes it gets buried. But I, I want to say I'm speaking for myself. Um, Peter Singer defines himself as an effective altruist. Many people on our team probably would not call themselves effective hedonists. But most people on our team, and even Peter, get excited by the idea. So I've been this person all my life that really likes to have a good time. Um, 
I, I like to play sports. I like to be in nature. I like to spend time with my family. Um, I like to eat. I like to drink. I mean, I've just generally been this person that really, I guess people would describe as hedonistic. However, as a psychologist and as a health psychologist, which I was for seven years, I realized that if you eat the wrong foods or you drink too much and you make some of these decisions that make you feel good at the time, but really aren't good for you, that you're not really being very effective in maximizing your lifelong pleasure. You're actually being ineffective. So as I was doing health psychology, I realized that I was what I was trying to do is help myself and other people make more effective decisions. So maybe you would have one or two drinks, but you wouldn't have five drinks. If you drank, you wouldn't get in your car. If you ate something with a lot of saturated fat, you wouldn't do it frequently, et cetera, et cetera. So how do you be hedonistic, but also think medium and long-term? And so that's part of the effectiveness part. And then when I read Peter Singer's book and I started realizing, oh my gosh, I have this opportunity to help children not be blind, help children not die of diarrhea, um, help people have bed nets. I said to myself, oh my gosh, I haven't really been very effective as a hedonist because I haven't really seen the opportunity to do this good, which gives me even more pleasure than having three or four drinks and and, and some really good food. So I, I started thinking of myself as aspiring to be an effective hedonist, that I was hedonistic and I was working hard to become more effective at it, first as a health psychologist and now as uh, somebody running a nonprofit. So I since the word effective altruist has been bandied about in the giving community, uh, most notably recently by Sam Bankman Fried and all of that disaster, I said, well, why don't we talk about effective hedonism and get people to realize that if you really like to enjoy yourself and spend time with your family, you can add tremendous amount of pleasure by extending that work into other areas, including how you give and how you benefit from the enjoyment of giving. So I don't know if that describes it, but I really feel like I'm an aspiring effective hedonist and I'm not there yet. There's many decisions I make that are not the right decisions. Um, like everyone about what I eat or how much I exercise or whatever, but all of those to me go into maximizing your medium and long-term pleasure versus your animal self, just like trying to get your pleasure right away. I don't know if that helps. I, 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 let me say, I appreciate that you've really intellectualize this i would say you know from my perspective just uh, uh it, just observing in my own life experience and observing the experience of the clients that i've worked with when when people proactively give they tend to be happy and when people are focused on themselves they tend to not be happy and so over the years i've really come to realize that that one of the one of the secrets of the universe that unlocks happiness is is to consciously and proactively make the decision to make to make the world better in ways that that provide no financial benefit to you and i've never seen that fail i've never had anyone that i've you know i've never i've never seen it fail in my own experience and i've never seen it fail Remember, I've encouraged other people who are unhappy to go out and do that. It, it always works every single time. And so to me, to me, that insight really unlocks a, a realization about the way we human beings are are made. And, and, and I think I'm saying what you're saying, except except you, you you're using bigger, better words. Not necessarily. I have to say I was unlucky enough. I alluded this to this in the past to have two parents that had serious mental illness um, and then a sister who died of an overdose of narcotics. So I, I had the misfortune to have a really um, unfortunate, unhappy family life. But what I observed in my mother and my sister, not my father, his problems were different, is that their, in, their intense focus on themselves and how they could be happier actually led to much of their destruction and that they were not externally focused or not. It led my mother to abandon her family so that she didn't even take care of her children, which my wife will never forgive her for. Um, I had forgiven her, but my wife hasn't forgiven her, but um, because she can't imagine leaving her kids, no matter how, how unhappy she was. But I observed that. And I think 
even though I've been a very self-centered person at various stages of my life, um, I think I always have known that if you have a sense of agency to really do things for other people, whether they're graduate students or your family, um, you find yourself getting happier. And um, that's part of being an effective hedonist. And I personally, even though the life you can say will probably never adopt the term effective hedonism as our lead, um, I'm going to live by it. And I'm going to try to get to be a better effective hedonist because I'm not giving up all the other forms of pleasure uh, that I really like either. And you don't have to. That's one of the interesting things. You don't have to give it up. And we're not asking people to give it up by helping other people. Right. I love it. I do too. I do too. Okay, Charlie, is there anything that we didn't cover that you wanted our listeners to know about? Not that I can think of off the top of my head. I think what you've allowed me to do is to talk about how being able to do this work to save children's lives um, and empower women to have livelihoods that they otherwise wouldn't have and children to get educated has actually in a way been saving my own life because otherwise I think I might have reached the age of 84, 10 years from now and look back on my life and said, you know, you did some nice things and you have a wonderful family. And most of that was because of your wife. Um, you really, uh, you really haven't done the things you want to do. And now I feel like um, over the last 10 years, and hopefully if I stay healthy over the next 10 years, I have this opportunity that I was lucky enough uh, to run into Peter Singer and be able to do this work. And uh, yeah, so I feel like I encourage people to go to our website, to listen to the podcast. But if somebody wants to make a substantial personal switch into this type of giving and they have the resources to do it and they want to invest, I encourage people to get in touch with me directly at charlie, C-H-A-R-L-I-E, at thelifeyoucansave.org, which is my email address. And I would love to share more about this journey without preaching to people or suggesting they have to give up the things they really care about. Because remember, they'd be talking to a hedonist. (laughs) <laughs> the perfect way to describe it. Well, thank you for listening. For everyone who has joined us today, this has been the Your Life, Your Legacy podcast with your hosts, Stan Miller and Katie Beth Hand. Our, de- our guest today has been Charlie Bresler. And for more information on Charlie and the projects that he does through The Life You Can Save, visit thelifeyoucansave.org. And you can listen to the podcast musings you can, uh, at thelifeyoucansave.org slash musings. We will also link both of those things for you guys in the show notes as well. Charlie, this was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Stan. Thank you very much, Katie. I really appreciate it. You've been listening to the Legacy Leaders Podcast with Katie Beth Hand and Stan Miller. For more information on them and the show, please visit PinnacleLegacyLaw.com. If you like what you've learned today, do share the program with your friends and subscribe wherever podcasts are found.